morning, everyone. Thanks for coming here after our unofficial American holiday yesterday. Um, so we have to cover follow sets today, right? I think everybody realizes that. Oh, there we go. Uh, that's why you just close out a Chrome. Uh, OK, so but first, I want to let you know Project 3 is posted on the website. Um, you should be looking through it. Oh, no. Uh, you should be looking through and reading it now. Like this is, you should be thinking about it. Uh, really, you should get started on it now. Uh, you have lots of time to uh, work on it. All right. Um, lots of time to work on it. It's due March fourth, um, but you will need all of this time. So if you're starting this project in March or even the end of February. Uh, there's going to be nothing I can do to help you. Uh, it's a complicated assignment, uh, but it's really cool because we're putting to practice the things that we've talked about in class. So you're going to be reading in the description of a context-free grammar, right? And to do that, we've actually given you uh, the description of the grammar that you're going to be reading in in the context-free grammar. So you have to write the code to interpret and that context-free grammar. Uh, then once you have that, then um, there are, so this would be an instance of a context-free grammar. I'm not gonna go into the details right now. We can go over more in depth on uh, Wednesday uh, or today if we have time. Uh, then there's three different tasks that you need to do. So one task, case zero, is a simple, just output some uh, information about the grammar to make sure that you've read it in properly. Uh, case one is calculate the first sets of the grammar uh, and then output those first sets. Uh, case two is calculate first and follow sets of the input grammar and output the follow sets. Uh, and so, kind of skipping down to the points, so this is kind of the point breakdown. Um, there'll be test cases on the servers for each of these things. Uh, on the submission server, you'll be given in that zip file those test cases will be a subset of the actual test cases that are on the server. So you won't have all of them, uh, so you have to be responsible for creating your own test cases. Uh, quick questions on this at a high level. Uh, I expect you to spend some time to read this because you'll be getting very, very, very familiar with it. You can do C or C++. Um, uh, one important thing I will note now, I'll try to note further on, um, you're going to be reading in an input language, right? So you can, we're specifically allowing you, if you want to, you can use the lexer.c and the lexer.h from Project 2, uh, but this is why we have this important warning here, right? That's for possibly a different input language with different tokens and symbols, right? So you can use that, but it's up to you to then modify it to work on this assignment. It's not just a drop-in replacement. If you try to do that, you will encounter a problem. Oh, uh, I see. Yes. Uh, but it's a good starting base. So you can rip uh, any code out of there, it's fine. You can rip functions out of there, whatever. That skip spaces function is kind of useful. Um, whatever you want to do. Uh, or you can just write something, a new lexer, or whatever, completely from scratch. Okay, and to help motivate the start early, start now, start reading the assignment now, uh, start thinking about how you're going to program this, right? Because this will help make sure that you actually understand how to do first and follow set calculations for the midterm on Friday. Uh, so it's good practice in that aspect. Um, also, so this is last semester's Project 3 grades. Reverse sorted, <laughs> right? So there's, I mean, if you don't start, these are people who started late, uh, didn't submit anything, submitted stuff that didn't work, didn't compile, didn't pass any of the test cases, right? So just like project two, it has to match exactly the output, right? Being kind of close doesn't count. Um, but you can see that it, you know, gets up in the 70s, that's good. It uh, gets into the 80s, and then we had a lot of people uh, who got 100. So, you know, there's a significant amount of people that got 90 or above. Uh, but it's hard, and it's supposed to be hard. Uh, so you, it's meant to challenge you, uh, challenge you and your skills and your design skills, because you're doing this basically all from scratch. All right. We'll get out of that. Bug me. Okay. <coughs> so now, 
let's talk about first sets. So why were we studying first sets? Why do we even care about first sets? You guys said so? Part of the reason, yes, but a deeper reason. I think I'll eventually make it easier to obtain a parse tree. Right. So our end goal, right, is to we want to um, we want to write a predictive recursive descent parser. So we want to be able to tell just by looking at one token from the input which rule to apply. Right. So we said that hey, if we calculate the first sets, then that can help us distinguish between which rule to uh, to follow when doing parsing. Uh, so for instance, if I have a grammar like this, S goes to big A, big B, little C. Uh, I have A goes to little A or epsilon. And I have B goes to little B, big B, or little A. Right. So then if I was calculating the first sets here, right, I'm not going to go through all the steps, but so let's first start with um, the easy case. Uh, what's the first set of A? Little a or epsilon. Little a or epsilon. Yeah. What's the first set of B here? B or A. B or A? Yeah. And so then what's the first set of S? A, B or epsilon. So A, <laughs> what was it? A, B or, a, B or epsilon. A, B or epsilon. A, B or epsilon. Oh yeah, A B A B. Right, so A, so we get the A, the small A from the fact that there's a big A here, right? So we add the first set of A minus epsilon to the first of S. Right? Which is going to be A. Now because there's an epsilon in the first set of big A, then we add the first set of the next one minus epsilon to S. So what's the so the first set of B minus uh, epsilon is the second containing B, the second containing A, so we add B. Do we add then the first of C to first of S? No. no, because there's not a first, exactly, there's not an epsilon in the first set of B. Yeah? Um, if there was no epsilon in big A, <coughs> would it just be, for the first set of S, would it just be A epsilon? So, if there was no A here like this? Yeah. We're just yeah. like that? Yeah. Uh, so then what would be the first of big A? A. Well, just A, yeah. And then the first of S would be? Yeah, we add the first of big A, right, minus epsilon, and then we say we add the next symbol if there is an epsilon in the first set of big A, right, which there's not. So we don't go further down the string. We don't look at anything else. Right. Yeah, so because of this, we know that all strings that S possibly generates, yeah. Do you have to start with A and B, or what if you start with S first? Uh, <coughs> you do not. You could do it in any order, but to do it like this without doing a table, I would like to. I would start with like the base cases that it's clear. Gotcha. It's just going to be based on that. And but if you do it, it doesn't matter what order you do it in per se. No, it's still in the same solution. Exactly. When you're programming it or when you're doing it in a table, it doesn't matter the order as long as you keep going until you reach uh, until nothing has changed by applying the rules. Yeah. So like based on that question, but I'm guessing you already answered it. So like for our assignment. Okay, so if I yeah, if you asked if I just asked you to calculate the first of S, yeah, then yeah, you only really need to see, see first of A, right? Right. Then you can look at first of A, but um, for parsing, we care about all the non-terminals, so oh, okay. that's why we do the whole table with all of them, right? Okay. Because at some point, we're gonna be parsing A, right? We want to decide between these two rules, and so then we need to know what's the first of A or what's the first of this other type. So yeah, there's definitely cases where we'll need it. And there you go. Well, we'll see in a second. Okay. So let's go back to parsing for a second, right? Let's say I have a string. So is this string in this language? <coughs> Does this grammar generate this string? No, not C. No. Oh, no, C is up there. Yes, that language can put that. Right, so 
So how do we tell? How can we tell? How can we prove? How do we prove that this string came from this grammar? Uh, yeah, that's the first check, right? We can see, okay, S, does it start with either an A or a B, right? If it doesn't, we can throw it away right away. Right? But the way we prove this is we show either a parse tree or a derivation, right, that says, hey, this is exactly how you can get to this string starting from S, right? So let's start try to draw the tree from here, right? So this is what parsing is going to actually do, but let's draw the tree here, right? So we have S, which rule of S production rule do I choose? This, right? Yeah, this one. There's only one choice. I don't have a choice. So it's got to be S goes to big A, big B, little C. Right? All right. Now we need to decide what does this A go to? Right? So looking one character ahead, which of these does this go to? Why can't I tell? I have the the first of this A is A, the first of this is Epsilon. Yes. So why can't I tell? Can't we say it goes to all three? Because there's two A's. So it could go to A and the first A and then A and B. What do you mean all three? There's only two rules here. We're trying to decide between these rules, right? So we're trying to draw the tree and say... The, the second part, the middle part is B and A, mm -hmm. which would come from the first of B. In the string? So can we say the first one comes from terminal A, since it's the first terminal A mm -hmm. comes from A, and then what, were, what was the other thing? The B and the A would come from terminal B. First. But how do we know that just from looking at one character, right? We're only looking at this one character. Because it's alone and it's by itself. It's in terminal A, and it's the first one we see in line of order. So we can select that one. Um. Way with isn't it A or epsilon? One of those. Right. Yeah, so that's that's the choice right now, right here. So we have to make a choice here. We're trying to parse this A. We need to decide just looking one character ahead, does this big A go to little a or does it go to epsilon? Can't tell. So why can't we tell? We have first sets, right? So we'll be able to tell. Both the first sets of A and B include lowercase a. So it doesn't mm. that Why do we care about B though? A, B, and little c. So B essentially comes after A. Right? If it was like, um, let's say it's like this. If it was like, I don't know, this, would we be able to tell? Yes. Yeah. Right? We know it has to, we can look one character ahead. It has to go to A. We can choose this rule. Right? But exactly what everyone is pointing out, right? The fact that we have an epsilon here means that, well, if this goes to epsilon, then this A that we just read could actually come from the B after it, right? It doesn't necessarily have to come from the A. So now we get to this problem of even though um, for each of these rules, if we just look at this B, so we can look at the first character and say it's either this rule, right, which does a little B, or it's a little A, right? I can distinguish between those rules. Here with the big A, I have a little A and an epsilon. Well, theoretically, I could distinguish between these two rules, Except that it depends on what comes after A. Right? So here, if this goes to epsilon, well, then this starting character that I'm looking at could have come from whatever came after A, right? Which is the purpose of epsilon. So the problem is right now, first sets don't help us. They don't help us to distinguish this case. Right? Specifically, when we have epsilons, first sets become uh, aren't actually enough. Because really, then the question is, OK, what does B start with? If B starts with an A, right, then I know that A should go to epsilon. But if B can't possibly start with an A, let's say it can only start with a little b, right, then I know I need to choose this rule A goes to little a, and A won't go to epsilon. So as it is, this grammar is actually... The um, problem is that the second A in the language of B. Say that again? So the problem is that second A in yes. the language of B. Exactly. But it's only a problem because B follows A 
here in this rule. Right? So the language as it is right now, we can't actually do a predictive parser to determine which rule to take here between little a and epsilon. But we need more information. We can't just use first sets. If we had, we could uh, change this grammar around and have it be BA, right? Yeah. Right, so here I could say, okay, this definitely goes to a B. I could say, okay, we have B, A, and little c, B, right, looking one character ahead, do I know which one of these two rules to choose? Yeah, yeah it's got to be this one, right, little a. Yeah, so that consumes that input. So now I go back to A, and I'm saying, okay, just looking at this B, can I decide which one? No. I have to choose epsilon, right? Yeah, it's definitely going to be epsilon, but is it correct? No. Right, we know that it can only be little c, right? So yeah, so this part here, so now I actually know here that it's a parsing error. Uh, if I were to change this, get rid of that, uh, let's see. Okay, if I were to change it here where I have C here, right, so I get this C. Now I can accurately determine between these two, right? Because I know from looking at this rule where A is used on the right-hand side, I can tell that, hey, if A goes to epsilon, then C must follow big A, right? So if, when distinguishing this rule here, I can say, okay, it's either little a or it's little c, and if it's little c, I choose epsilon, otherwise I give up. So this gets us to the concept of the follow sets. So first sets describe the all strings that that, that, that uh, subtree can generate, right? So the first set of B describes the starting terminal for all strings that B can generate. The follow set says, hey, what could start after B, right? So all possible combinations of terminals that come after B, what's that character that can come after B is generated? Let's look at an example. So let's get into some types. So the so when we think about the follow set, it's going to return a set of terminals, right? So it's the thing that can follow this character, right? But can epsilon ever really follow the character? Mm, not that we care about. Right. Yeah. yeah not that we care about. Right. It, it's. Um, we're going to be looking at the string, right? There's going to be no epsilon in the string, so we want to know if what that actual character is. Uh, what about, if I look at here, what, um, what follows S? So if you draw here, right, it's going to generate some big tree. What's that first thing that's going to be after S? end of the file or the end of the string, right? Because S is going to generate the whole thing. Uh, so we'll use the symbol actually from regular expressions of the dollar sign. So here the dollar sign represents end of file or end of input, right? Uh, so we want that in our follow sets, right? That kind of makes sense. So our follow sets are going to return either a set of terminals and the end of file, a set containing either terminals or the end of file, which we're representing with the dollar sign. And the input is going to be a non-terminal. So we have a grammar, right? We're looking at grammars. S goes to A, B, C, big A, big B, big C, A goes to little a, B goes to big B, little b, or B, C goes to big C, C, or epsilon. So we want to ask, just kind of looking at this, right? Let's try to develop some intuition by looking at this. So what's the follow of S? End of file, right? And we know because it's the starting non-terminal, right? So that all, you know, S is going to be the root of all possible parse trees. Is in every context-free grammar S going to be exactly the end of file? No. No? no. Why no? Is end of file always going to be in S's follow set? Yes. 
Yeah, so it's actually our first rule that we'll look at, right? Mm -hmm. So it's the starting non-terminal. It all is always the root, right? So there's nothing about a context-free grammar that says S can't actually be a rule here on the right-hand side somewhere, right? So S will always be the root, but that doesn't mean it also doesn't appear as a non-terminal in the grammar. But that's fine. We know how to deal with that, right? We just expand it out. So then what follows A in this example? Big A. And where do we look? Right? We talked about where to look for first sets. Where do we look for follow sets? The next character. The first set. Which one whatever of these rules, come, these production rules? Whatever would, could, whatever would come directly after the first A, Big A? Does it refer to B? Can B come after A here? No. no. Or. Bars are or, right? Yeah. So this means three. there's three different rules here. It could be an A or a B <laughs> or a C. So B actually, big B can't actually follow A. Right? Do you look at this rule? Does this rule tell us anything about what can come after this rule here? Well, it's a terminal, so after it would be nothing. Anything We're but talking about big A, right? Right, isn't it anything? Right, so think about it in terms of the tree, right? So you can I write with this? So we have our tree, whoa, this is cool. Can you guys see that? All right, this is really, okay. So we have our tree A, right? This rule describes everything that comes, this is really hard to actually write like this. <laughs> That's way more sensitive than the other one. Okay, right, so we have our A here. This, this rule describes everything that can come here, right? So this is why for first sets, we care about that because we care about what's here, right? What's the first terminal that this tree could possibly generate? But for follow sets, what do we care about? Whatever comes after. What comes after. after? Yeah, right? So this rule tells us absolutely nothing about what, come, what comes after this first set. Wow, this looks really terrible. Um, <laughs> this is why I'm not an artist. Um, right? So this rule doesn't tell us anything, right? So when we calculate follow sets, we don't want to, uh, we don't, we only care about looking where the non terminal, in this case, A, is used in the rule itself here, or in on the right-hand side. We don't care about where it's on the left-hand side. Right? The left-hand side only tells us what it actually generates, but its usage tells us what could possibly come afterwards. So from looking at this, what follows A? Is that the end spot? Dollar sign? The same thing that follows S, right? It's S will generate A, right? So we know that from this rule we have S S goes to A, right? And then there's nothing after A here. So it's got to be whatever S, whatever follows S also follows A, right? So A is going to also be the end of file. So what about for B? What, which of these four production rules do we look at to try to calculate the follow of B? Well, we have to look S. at B first, because we have to figure out what the first of B is. No. We don't care about the first of B. <coughs> so we may not care about it. That's not 100% true. S and but B? Yeah. So we care about rules one and three. Right? Why rule three? I thought I just made a whole terrible drawing about why we don't care about looking because at that. Because it references rule. itself. B is a recursive rule. It's on the right hand side, right? That's what's important. So we look at all the rules where B is on the right hand side, and that occurs in rule one and rule three. Right? So from rule one, what do we say is the follow set of B? Just the dollar sign. Yeah, the dollar sign, right? The end of file. What about from here? What follows B here? B. Lowercase b. Lowercase b, yeah. Right? So we know whenever we see a B, the next thing after a capital B better be either the end of file or a little b. Right? So what about for C? What follows C? Which rules do we look at? One through four. One and four. One and four. All right. So what do we get from the follow set of C for rule one? Dollar sign. Yeah, same thing, right? Dollar sign. What about here? What do we get for the follow set of C? Lowercase c. Lowercase c. What about that epsilon? Doesn't matter. Leading back to dollar sign. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, the epsilon doesn't matter, right? We don't care because we're only looking at the usage in the rules. Right, we're only looking at where is big C here and what follows right after it. Okay. Rules 
for a second. So, we kind of already have our first rule, right? Right? So, we know that the end of file should be in the follow set of s, right? So, if we have a rule How do we calculate the follow set of D? We have to look through all the rules and find where D is on the right hand side. So we just have this I mean, no, just this that, that rule. This is where it's used. Yeah. Dollar sign. <coughs> Why? Because there's nothing after it. Because there's nothing after it, so then what do we do? Dollar sign. Is it because there's an epsilon there? Is there an epsilon here? After D, I don't know. Should we add the follow of S to the follow of D? Why? Think about the tree, right? So S, right, we have S. We know S is going to generate some tree. A little better tree. Right, so we know the first rule here that we're looking at, S goes to A, D, I didn't leave myself in a room here, C, and D, right? Now we think about this tree that D generates, <coughs> what do we know about its relation to S? When the D tree ends, the S tree ends? Yes, because it's the rightmost non-terminal, right? So whatever tree that D generates, right, this care what we care about here is what possible terminals or end of files could be after S, right? So if I say, okay, if I already know that, if I've already calculated it for S, right? And I have a rule that says, well, the rightmost symbol here, D, generates the rightmost tree. So this means that the end part here is going to be the same. Right? It's either going to come from D or it's going to come from S. Right? So then we should add whatever was in the follow of S to the follow of D. And we know this because it's the rightmost symbol. I think I may be going in these in the wrong order, but that's fine. So then, kind of by the same logic, let's say I have the same rule, right? But now I have, I know that, um, let's see, first of D is, well, let's say it's D epsilon. So does this change this rule? No, right? We should still do that all the time because it's always on the right-hand side here, right? So how does this knowledge that there's an epsilon here in the first set of D, does that change? Do we do anything different here? Yeah? I don't think you would do anything different just because it's kind of like the same logic as picking D, like little D. So you pick little D and then after that, Okay, let's think about it a, different, uh, a little different way. So just using this kind of logic, where do I move follow set of S, right? So here I can basically say I add the follow set of S to the follow set of D because D is the rightmost symbol, right? right? Can I use that logic here with, I don't want to erase it because I don't want to draw it again. Let's just move the screen up so it's gone. Can I use that logic here to add the first set of S to the first set of C? follow of C, right? I want to see where follow of S goes. So I say, I always add the follow of S to the follow of D. So for any, and it doesn't have to be S, right? So this kind of says for any rule, right? For any production rule, you can add the left-hand side's follow set to the right-hand, rightmost symbol's follow set, right? Because they're going to be the last part of the tree. Well, if the rightmost follow set is empty string. Yeah, we don't have enough knowledge for that. Let's say we don't know that or we can't assume that at this point. So then do we add the follow set of S to the follow set of C? Mm, we can't because you don't know what C is. 
Yeah, we can't because, right, when we look at the tree, we see, okay, at C is going to generate some part of this tree, right? But what follows S doesn't necessarily follow C, right? Because there's a D in the way. We can see that, right? Unless we know that D could possibly go to epsilon, right? So we know there's some possibility that we have right, uh, A, B, C, D. So we have some possibility that this goes to epsilon. So what does that tell us about C's tree here? Yes, it is the, in that case, it would be the rightmost subtree here, right? Which means that whatever follows S also must follow C. So what if there's an epsilon and C's follow set? Then B. Then B, right? And then what about the follow set first, the epsilon in the first set of D? So this is why we need first sets, right? Because we've calculated, the first sets tell us that, hey, this could go to epsilon. This is one way that we could do it. Um, so basically, I'll kind of write this would be rule two. These aren't the actual ordering numbering that I use, I think. But this rule is kind of like base case. These two rules are very related. Um, they tell us how to propagate the left-hand side to the right-hand side. So follow set. So basically, this would be like add. Uh, Follow of S to uh, follow of C uh, if uh, epsilon is in, sorry, uh, let's change that. If uh, epsilon is in the first of D. And right, so you can probably assume that there's a way to write this mathematically, so it works for any kind of I in here. You can always add the other one if there's uh, e epsilons in the first sets here, right? So we'll see that in a second. But the logic here is very simple. So we can always add the right, we can always add the leftmost side to the rightmost side, <coughs> right? Follow set, and then we can add the left side to the second one if there's an epsilon in that first set. to calculate, you know, follow of S into follow of D, right? But this rule, what do I know about this rule for the follow of B? It's going to be C. Why? Because C is a terminal. And what do we know about C, for little c from this rule? It follows B. Yeah. It, you know, follows B, right? So, Let's change it slightly. Let's go back to where we're going. All right, now we have big C. Let's say I know, because I've calculated this, and I did it correctly, that the first of big C is the second containing C. Now what do I know about the follow of B? It's the first of big C. The first of big C, why? First of, well, it can be the first of big C as long as the first of big C is not epsilon. Yeah, so it's the first of big C minus epsilon, yes. right? Um, and we can also know that because epsilon is not in our follow sets, right? So that's part of why the type checking helps, <laughs> is that it should only be terminals or end of file, the dollar sign, right? If you ever have epsilon in a follow set, you've done something wrong. Right? So just because they're next to each other, right, I know, right, and it goes back to the trees again, right, I know at some point this rule is going to be chosen, and I really don't want to draw the tree again, so I'm just going to go back here, right, so I know that B is going to generate some tree, and so if I, ah, I do have to draw it, because I think it's an important point. I'm going to try to draw it bigger, like that tree. So 
C generates something, D generates something, right? B is going to generate something, and A is going to generate something. So in this picture, right, what is the first of C? It's little C, but what is it in this picture? Yeah, it's right here, right? It describes all characters here that could potentially, let's see, by pushing hard at this, kind of, um, right? It describes all terminals that C could possibly start with, right? That subtree, right? And then if I look at subtree B, this is exactly what I'm looking for. I'm looking for what are the terminals that could possibly come for after B, right? And I've already calculated the first of C, so I know I can add that first of C minus epsilon to B. So then let's change this slightly, and we still have this rule. And what if we say that the first of uh, the first of C is now C epsilon, and let's say first of D is the second pane. So what's the follow of B? The first of C minus epsilon. And then because there's an epsilon in the first of C, then I can add the first of D to the first of B. And follow To the follow of B, yes. These do get a little bit tricky. And so I'd also do this here, obviously, for if I was trying to calculate the follow of B, I, or A, I'd use the same thing. I would say, okay, look at this rule. Add the first of B to the minus epsilon to the follow of A. If there's an epsilon to the first of B, then add the first of C to the follow of epsilon, or follow of A, um, and so on and so forth. So that's, these are basically rules four and five. Is right? that big C over there? Where? Here's big C, this is little c. And the follow B above the line, that's a Little c. Okay. And then Anything in the sets, right, are terminals. They gotta be terminals, so those are little c's. These are non-terminal. Also non-terminal. Which one did you define as rule four? Uh, rule four is the simple case, just always add the one after you, right? So if you wanna calculate the uh, follow of B, right, you should add the one after you, right? Add the thing that comes after you, add their first set minus epsilon to your follow set. Done. Always do that, you never have to think. The only time where there's a possible case is if there's an epsilon here. And of course, if there's something else after we're here like E and there's an epsilon in the first of D, you would add the first of E to the follow of B, right? It's just a simple uh, recursive thing you keep applying. Uh, questions on like the intuition or ideas behind these rules? We can look at what they exactly mean. Hopefully I didn't mess you up with the order is different, but. So if we have a non-terminal A, we want to calculate the follow of A. Well, we saw we first need the first sets, right? So, you know, when you're, um, doing your homework and stuff, right? You want to make sure that your first sets are pretty rock solid, right? Because follow sets depend on the first sets. So if your first sets are broken, it really doesn't make too much sense to spend a lot of time coding follow sets when you got something fundamentally wrong there. Okay, so we're going to do this in the exact same way. So it's going to be fairly straight, hopefully straightforward if, if we've been following the first set calculation. Follow set should be easy. Um, so we first are going to initialize everything to the empty set. Right? So we say that, okay, all the follow sets are empty sets. And then we apply these five rules that we just derived until nothing changes, right? And we're going to do that in steps. Right? So the first rule is the rule we talked about, right? If for the starting, the starting symbol of the grammar, add the uh, end of file to its follow set, right? Which makes sense, right? We saw. If you're the root, right, then end of file has to come after you. Okay, oh, we did do it in the right order, that's good, cool. So if we have some rule of the form 
B goes to alpha A, right? What was alpha that we've been using as kind of a symbol? Like a sequence of symbols. Yeah, a sequence of symbols, non-terminals, terminals, we don't care, right? Just anything that just means the rightmost one. Epsilon could also be a blank, a sequence of length zero, right? In the case that there's just B goes to A, <coughs> right? Then we add follow of B to the follow of A. Right, so the way I like to think about it, this first rule, base case, right? Always do this. These next two rules tell you how to propagate follow sets. Right, so this says, hey, uh, I can always add the follow set of the left-hand side of my production rule to the follow set of the rightmost symbol. And this next rule says, okay, what if A has an epsilon in its follow set, or in its first set, sorry. If A has epsilon in its first set, then we're going to add the rightmost symbol of alpha. Right? And this just says we can keep doing that as many times as we want. So for all of these, let's call it, we're using C here, right? C 0 through K, right? As long if there's an epsilon in all of those first sets, we can continually add the follow set of B to the follow set of A here. We can do this as many times as necessary. These are just about propagating follow sets, right? So you only need the first sets here to deal with this third rule. So our next rule says, okay, what do we do when two things are next to each other in the rules, right? So this just says, if we have whatever rule here, and actually in this case, we don't even care about B at all. B has absolutely nothing to do with what we're trying to do here. We say, okay, if we want to calculate the follow of A, Oh, well, we just take the next symbol, right? Add the first of the next symbol, whatever it is, non-terminal, terminal, right? Take the first of that minus epsilon and add it to the false set of A. Yeah? Question on rule three. So for example, if um, C0, so let's say C1, C2 through CK uh, are just epsilon, and then C0 is a little C or epsilon, then if you do follow A, it will be little C or <coughs> Um, that's what the next rule gets to. Is what to do? What to do if there's an epsilon in the first of C zero? But in this case, you just always add um, this. You always do. So it doesn't matter what's okay, in the so first. It just said that you always add. It yes. Mean that it's only uh, exactly. Okay. Yeah. So all these rules keep adding keep and changing adding things. Okay. Yeah. They um, uh, they don't tell you what it exactly is. Right? Even this first one. Right. right? Doesn't say that S has to be right. the second thing of it. Exactly. So then the next rule just says, okay, if there's an epsilon in the first of C0, then you can add the first of C1 minus epsilon to the follow of A. And then if there's an epsilon in the first of C1, then you can add the first of C2 to the follow of A. And you can do that for as many times as there's epsilon in those first sets. Right? Because we've calculated, okay, we know that there's an epsilon in the first set of C0. We know there's some combination of rules where A is going to be followed by C1, whatever the first of C1 is. And then the same thing, C1 could go to epsilon, and so, okay, then we can add C2, right? This just says it in a mathematical way that means we can do this as many times as we want for all, all possible Ks that meet this criteria. Questions? run through an example. The nice thing about follow sets, so if you think about it, right, do these two change based on what the current follow sets are? No. Does the first one change? No. Right? So this is only adding first sets to follow sets. Right? It's first sets to follow sets. The first one is just adding dollar sign to the follow set in this particular case, right? So actually, Rules two and three are the only ones that change, and basically these say how the first sets should propagate. These kind of say uh, how to <coughs> populate the first sets. So um, I don't have like a proof for it, but all the times I've done it, follow sets kind of converge very quickly. So uh, you apply the rules, and then you do a few steps, and then you're kind of done. Let's look uh, at an example. I think it's the grammar we've been working with so far in the slides examples. Right, we have S goes to A, B, C, D, 
A goes to big C, big D, or little a, big A, D goes to big B, C goes to little c, big C, or epsilon, D goes to little d, big D, or epsilon, right? So we've already calculated the first sets of all of these, right? So what's the first part of our algorithm for calculating the follow sets? Initialize everything to zero. Not zero. Empty set. Empty set, right? So we initialize them all to zero. We have our first sets. Uh, we have our rules. I need to clearly do that better. Um, OK, right? So we do our first rule. We say, OK, let's kind of get the follow of s, right? So we say, does the first rule apply? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then we say, is s used in any of the right hand sides of this production rules? No. no. Exactly. So the other rules, right, rules two through five, only apply if it's used on the right-hand side. If it's not, then you don't have to worry about it. OK, what about calculating A? Which of the 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 rules am I going to look at? <coughs> 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. What am I looking for? How do I know? I want to calculate the follow of big A here. Uppercase A on the right hand side. Yes, I look at for uppercase A on the right hand side. So which of these rules has uppercase A on the right hand side? Rule two. And one. rule one. Right? So we'll start with rule one, because it's first. Right, so we only look at this and we say, uh, is it the starting non-terminal? Nope. Nope. Uh, is it the rightmost symbol? Is there epsilons all the way from A to, in the first sets of all the symbols from A to the end of the grammar? No. To the right hand side? First of B is little b, so no. Right? So this rule can't apply. This says there has to be epsilons in all of them. B, C, D. Yeah, B, C, D. Uh, does rule four apply? Is there something after A? So what's the symbol that's after big A here? B. 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 So then we add the first of B minus epsilon. Then we add the first of B minus epsilon to the follow of A. Mm -hmm. So we have B. Then is there an epsilon in the first of B? No. Nope. Yeah. So we're done. This rule doesn't apply. So now we got to move to our second rule, right? We have to look at every place that A is used. And we say, OK. It's not, we know it's not the starting non-terminal, right? Um, is it the rightmost symbol here? Yes. Yes. So which, which of the follow sets am I going to add to the follow set of A? Follow set of B? The follow set of A. Yeah, the follow set of A, right? How do I know the follow set of A? I'm calculating the follow set of A. Because A is on the left-hand side of the other. Right, so this says, you can add the follow set of the left-hand side to the follow set of the rightmost one, right? This B is just a placeholder that says it's the left-hand side of this rule, right? So here I can take the follow set of A, add it to the follow set of A. How do I know the follow set of A? Currently empty. Currently empty. I've calculated it, right? This is why I pre-calculate it. So I add the empty set to there. It doesn't change anything. Um, I say uh, there's nothing after us, so this rule poss can't possibly apply. Then we say. There's nothing after us, so we can't add anything that comes after big A here, right? So this rule doesn't apply. This rule also doesn't apply. So the false set of A is little b. Then calculating the false set of b, right, I look at uh, this rule, the top rule, right? So I'm going to say it's not the starting non-terminal, right? Is it the rightmost symbol? No. Are there epsilons in everything in the first set of everything after b to the end of this rule? Yes. 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 So I have to add the first of what to the first of b? The first of s. The first of s, right? So the first of b is going to have an uh, end of file in it, right? Because we calculated it here. You mean the follow of s? Hmm? The follow of s. There's an epsilon in what comes after it, from the end after it to the end of the, the grammar, right? So we check the first of C and the first of D, and there's epsilons in here. So then we say, OK, this rule just says add the first of whatever's after it to the uh, follow of big B. So what's 
the first, what's the symbol that comes directly after it? C. 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 Capital C. So we take the first of C minus epsilon, <coughs> add it to the follow of B. So B, what can follow B right now is end of file and C. And then we say, does rule five apply? Can we move on? Yes. Yeah. yeah. All right, we can move on because there's an epsilon in the first of C. So then what, which symbols, which symbol and what do we add to the follow of? We add the first of D minus epsilon to the follow of D. Right, so we're gonna add will D. And we're done. All right, we've gone through there. We have dollar sign C and D. <coughs> Uh, for the follow set of C, which rules do we look at now? One, one and two and then three. Four. And four. Yeah. One, two, and four. Five. Right, one, two, and four. So here we say, if, uh, we know something starting non terminal. We say, um, is it the rightmost symbol? No. Nope. Uh, is there epsilon in the first sets of all the symbols after us to the end of this rule? Yep. Yes. Yes. Yep. Right, so then we add the follow of S to the follow of C, which is going to give us the dollar sign. And this rule says add the thing that comes after us. What's the thing that comes after us? D. D. Yeah, so add, take the first set of D, subtract epsilon, so add D there. Uh, is there anything after D? Nope. No. So this rule can't possibly apply. So we have, uh, I forgot it already. Oh, uh, dollar, sign dollar sign and D, right? Then we have to look at the next rule where it's used. So we say, uh, is it the rightmost symbol? No. No. Uh, are there epsilons in all of the symbols from C to the end of this rule that we're looking at now? Yes. 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 So then we add what to the follow of C? D. propagating the follow of A, right? So we do the follow of A to the follow of C, which is little d, little b. Um, and then we would add the first of big D to the, to the follow of C, right, which we've already done. Uh, there's no symbols afterwards. This doesn't possibly hold. Uh, and then here, we go through this again and say, OK, right, same thing. This applies. It's the rightmost non-terminal. So we take C, add it to the Add the follow of C to the follow of C. Um, there's nothing after us, so none of these apply. So we have the follow of C is dollar sign B and B. Right? And this is an important thing, right? This little B came from the follow of A. Uh, so we're five minutes over. I'll just continue doing this uh, and record it and put it online uh, if you want to, or you can leave. I don't know. It's up to you. We go over the last one real quick. Yeah. You gotta go, you gotta go. But it'll be it'll be recorded. Okay, now I want to calculate the follow of D, right? So which rules do we gotta look at here? The production rules. Uh, one, one, two, and five. One, two, and five, yeah, right? Any place there's a big capital D. So um, we say does this rule apply? Is D the rightmost symbol? Yes. 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 So we add what? Follow of S to the follow of D, exactly. Uh, does this rule apply? Is there anything after it? No. no. <coughs> no. Uh, does this rule apply? Is there anything after it? No. Does this rule apply? No. Nope. So we look at the next rule, right? So we've added the dollar sign. Then we say, OK, is it the rightmost symbol? Yep. Yep. Yes. So we add the follow, follow of A. The follow of A to the follow of D, right? So we're going to have dollar sign and little b. Uh, we go through this again, right? So it doesn't have it, doesn't have it, doesn't have it. Then we look at the next one. We say, is it the rightmost? Yes. 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 So we add the follow set of D, D to the follow set of D, right? So we have the empty set to what we're calculating. Doesn't change anything. There's nothing afterwards. So we get dollar sign uh, B. And so, cranking through these all again, we would get the same thing, which I'll let you do this practice on your own. Um, there's also for, uh, I'll be releasing the practice midterm today. Um, I will say the slides have a pretty good, uh, we won't go over this, but we maybe touch on it a little bit in class, but I won't go super in depth onto it, but um, 
It turns out emails are super complicated, so there's an example of a context-free grammar for emails, and we walk through calculating this uh, simplified grammar's first and follow sets. So one way to self-check is go through, use this grammar, and generate first and follows on that on your own, and then check with the slides to make sure you're doing it right.